All right. All right. So I have uh, Thomas Wynn with me finally. <laughs> We've been looking forward to this conversation on uh, negative pragmatism and lack. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll just open it up with lack um, and Heidegger. Why is Heidegger important? Why can What can Heidegger teach us about lack or uh, a negative pragmatism if we were to stretch it that far? What would a Heideggerian negative pragmatism look like? You could even say that would be a curious question to explore um, because I've just been, you know, before I combine and say what negative pragmatism is, I've just been really just like sort of interested in like what everybody has to share and offer and the sort of understanding and certain thinkers. So um, I'll leave that to you, Thomas. <laughs> I, yeah, I was trying to work out when, when was the last time we spoke. I know we did um, nihilism and religion. I think that was yeah. like two years, you know, like a year. Yeah. yeah, that's like almost like two years now. Yeah, and that was a nice conversation, like that. Mm. And actually, that, that's that's a nice context for this conversation in a way, because that was kind of confronting the question of lack in terms of religion. You know, mm. like not not so much religion as it's established in the day to day going ons of like established religions, but the spiritual question of how like why nihilism if nihilism means like the lack of meaning or the lack of truth or the lack of the like the lack to the, the lack of grounding yourself upon some kind of absolute foundation so that's where nihilism normally comes into the equation you know like how does that what does that mean in relation to like spiritual experience and i think now maybe this conversation is quite nice because of course it's like my whole work kind of is concluding with heidegger at the moment you know um and, yeah and like it's just nice because i think before heidegger in my own experience of the question of lack there's also more contemporary thinkers who do affirm what i think you're trying to get with in terms of like um yeah like a pragmatism which keeps at the forefront of its thinking the question of lack maybe not even like the ontology of lack meaning you believe that life or being or beyond being like not not even non-being or being but somewhere in between like that's a lack like there's something about it which is lacking something which means that if, if we're going to confront like the social cultural shared space or even the self reflective space we need to incorporate um at least the question of lack you know mm -hmm. like what does it mean to lack because then I think we can look around and say like, okay, what what happens then to thinking? Like, for example, nihilism. If if I if I'm a nihilist, which I'm not really a nihilist, but I at least question the failure of thinking, what does that mean for them confronting the social, economic, political world? You know? Like mm -hmm. if I know that I can never have like an absolute correct ideology concerning the way things should be in society like how how am i how am i going to deal with that you know and i think this is where pragmatism comes in for even for the likes of slavoj zizek whose philosophy critiques um aspects of like the hermeneutical tradition which normally ends up in a type of anglo-saxon pragmatism so when he critiques um some u.s readers of hegel like brandon he's critiquing their pragmatism because they basically he says they deflate the speculative metaphysical edge of hegel and they just look to this kind of uh, empirical world of knowledge to say oh we can't do anything absolute so we just have to deal with knowledge in its pragmatic effects you know like so richard rorty is a big name in this world and one of the thinkers of my phd johnny vattimo uh he's from italy but he affirms he affirmed when he was alive he died recently he affirmed um the thought of richard rorty to say yes like if you follow the critique of metaphysics in the end of western philosophy which is what sujajek also does like post-kantian philosophy um you'll find that the only thing you can do is just affirm knowledge insofar as it has effects for us that can be pragmatically used like we're no longer seeking absolute truth with knowledge we're just seeking a way to deal with maybe lack or a way to deal with the failure of the type of thinking that philosophy tried to give, get with or propose or you know encounter the type of truth that it tried to find and then it failed 
So what if we have pragmatics in a way? I think this is a really th big thing. And I think actually the way you've introduced this, and I'll stop talking in a second, <laughs> through Heidegger. Um, I think Heidegger, like we said just two minutes before we started this, like you, you, when you said like reading this into Nietzsche or finding this in Nietzsche, Nietzsche criticized the type of pragmatism of his age, you know? Like he would call it the, the timely wisdom of his age, which was always about like, and this is what Kant was critiquing as well, which is why Nietzsche in his early years liked Kant because Kant was critiquing a type of empiricism and rationalism, which just said like, it's really deflated. It was like, well, we can't do too much. We just have to look around, make some equations about what is, and then that's it. We just have to deal with life. We have to cope with life. But for, of course, as we know with Nietzsche, that's not life affirmation. And as Heidegger would have said throughout his life, like pragmatism was not encountering truth because it presupposes that, yeah, it presupposes too much in a way. We can go into what it presupposes if you want, but but I would be interested, like, to reverse this, like, have, how how have you how's your thinking developed? You know, Cause I know you've done some videos with Chaitan and others, and like, where are you at now with lack? Do you? And so my question, I think, because this came up in the net, like, I know, like, <laughs> the net with OG Rose has been really useful because I think it always, when I look at the titles of the videos and stuff, it's always like lack or not knowing lack, you know? Like, how do we experience this lack? What what does it mean to lack, you know? Like, and so my question is, do you think that there is really kind of like an ontological lack, meaning that life itself or being itself or you yourself will always lack? Because I think from what I've heard with you and like in conversations on the net, it seems like you do follow like what most people are following for good reasons like the idea that when i relate to myself whenever i relate to my partner partners ex-partners anything future things ideas graduation like you i think you understand and i also would understand to a certain point like you have to be aware that there will be some contradictions or antagonisms or inconsistencies and desires that aren't can't be fulfilled you know so lack will always kind of be there in some sense so yeah that's my question to you as well yeah this <laughs> that's this good um, a little bit. yeah yeah uh what i've thought about so far is i think i think i really like the idea of death drive being involved actually the death drive being the very thing that sort of drives that wants uh, a kind of stasis, go, going back to a state of inert. Um, and I think uh, my talk with Jaitan kind of made me realize, like, if pragmatism is so practical, and that's really the appeal to it, however way they decide to do it, whatever form it is, the, mm -hmm. the fundamental idea behind it is that it's practical. Whatever, again, whatever notion of practical, it seems to be but whatever is a practical is fundamentally efficient right now we can argue about what is more efficient and not but the aim is efficiency and practicality so the way that we look at it now is that pragmatism like this kind of aims to maximize or accelerate the death drive mm -hmm. um, because it wants to um immediately remedy whatever the situation calls for mm -hmm. and whatever whatever you know whatever situation it is um, whether it be people or things or so on um, when it calls to remedy something um, the efficient way is to solve it right away <laughs> right so mm -hmm. that that's the that's what I've noticed um, and but the problem is, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to moralize pragmatism in that sense either, but I'm trying to say that there is something about pragmatism being the only option when it comes to having issues like this. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is that when it comes to either contradictions, uh, irresolvable situations, or seemingly irresolvable situations. Um, I find the pragmatic solution or the pragmatic approach to be insufficient, actually, um, even though it is supposedly supposed to be kind of a foundationalist, foundationalist 
um, approach, kind of like the way Rorty talks about it, right? Like it's anti-foundation. Um, but but maybe you're saying like these pragmatisms still rely on the type of foundation, yeah? Like they still have their presuppositions, like they go into knowledge, like thinking, yeah, we're being critical towards foundations, mm -hmm. but then they just kind of deflate themselves, which is a big word in mm -hmm. anti-pragmatic thought is to say like you're deflating the speculative side of knowledge, which can actually do things. So for example, psycho psychoanalysis itself, I'm sure Chaitan would agree, is anti-pragmatic at that point which it says well it's not just about dealing with thinking it's about knowing it's actually like not knowing the true self inside of you but in the psychoanalytical lacanian sense like knowing that you are barred that like you can't get to <laughs> what you think you are because you posit yourself you know like you you imagine who you think you are and at that point you encounter i think this is this is maybe like just uh sorry for interrupting but like that's why I th I've seen from you in conversations on the net when I've heard you talk and everything and when you're bringing in these ideas. But then I think what, why you're interested in it is is the same reason why the first three main thinkers of my PhD are interested in pragmatism. And in a way, they critique pragmatism because they pass through it to say, well, there is the question of absolute knowledge, philosophy, psychoanalysis, an encounter with being or the real, you know, but after I think a lot of these thinkers say, when you pass through truth in the philosophical speculative sense, even the truth of non-truth or Jadi Ratima, then you can have a type of pragmatism, but you're being a lot more nuanced about it. You know, you're not mm. just assuming certain aspects. For example, like um, Zizek and Vatimo always critique Habermas and the way that Habermas approaches rationality the way that he approaches knowledge, which is based on a lot, a lot of modern assumptions that a lot of contemporary philosophy has worked through, you know, like 20th, 21st century philosophy. It's like there's a lot of books that would, would have and have critiqued Habermas's type of philosophy because he assumes too many things about knowledge, but then also reduces it to like a kind of shared space of logical rationality or reasoning, you know. But then it doesn't encounter what I think, and this is our conversation, nihilism and religion, that I think we both recognize with knowledge. Like knowledge can actually kind of bring you to that space of mystery or mm -hmm. or what we said, like the, the negation of the negation, which is still a big part of my, my reading of Zizek, because it's like, well, you need to even question the field of thinking that is pragmatism. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you're not just negating old dogmatic metaphysics for pragmatism you have to realize that that very trajectory itself is itself a type of field which can also then be rolled over and you know yeah sorry for interrupting yeah no i mean it's funny because it's like i can tell like how pragmatic our culture is because they say something like what's the point of philosophy Right. Mm -hmm. And that that and it's always okay. so funny it's, it's, to reveal that. Just water, by the way, that's not alcohol. <laughs> okay. Whenever I'm walking down the street and drinking this, people do look at me, but it's just water. I promise. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not just sitting here. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, the, even the idea of you know people are saying like, what's the point of philosophy? Is a very that's a very pragmatic approach already. Like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see any its use. It doesn't have a use for me immediately mm -hmm. um, or or even what came up for me the other week was this um idea of like this is why we are kind of liberals in that sense is because we we say what's the use in philosophy this is my interpretation and that's yours yeah and in that space which i think was an important move in human history you know was to be skeptical enough to say i'm no longer going to seek truth in my political program i'm no longer going to seek truth in my opinion of you directly or a group of people or an ideal instead i'm just gonna like give you space and like that's the liberal motive you know and i think in a way that was a necessary step in in human thinking like you can't stop there because there's still is speculative ideas that need to be confronted um but i think it was an important point so a lot of my work is about connecting that moment of opening up to the other and so using knowledge for pragmatic ends that is a kind of necessary pathway for what I like with Heidegger, which is letting people be or letting mm. things be because 
for Heidegger, that's that's being own absolute way, actually, absolute. It's beyond history, actually, for Heidegger, where he says, like, the only thing we can do as human beings is let things be, which is the easiest thing to do because you realize that beings already letting people be <laughs> and places <laughs> and I, like it's literally the easiest thing, by the way. Philosophy is really easy when you follow Heidegger. Um, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, it's true. <laughs> I really think this. Yeah. Um, but then in that space of letting people be, it's like you have truth, in my opinion. But then you also have pragmatics where you say, in this contingent particular moment, I'm not looking for truth in you or in this political program. But at that precise point, I can use pragmatically those history of interpretations and ideas that we're thrown into. So kind of, and I don't. This is I don't it's like this language is a bit tricky because I'm saying this because I'm reading Batimo again. So he talks about this a lot. Like I can use the history of philosophy or thinking or culture or place in my own particular instance to reinterpret you, to reinterpret the group, to reinterpret you know society, and that's pragmatics. It's saying like I'm look because I'm not looking for truth in that way. I'm not looking for truth in the content of a political program. I'm not looking for a truth in my idea of you, you know? So like the, the deconstruction, deconstruction motive is like to say, well, because I'm no longer looking for truth in that space, because we use language to communicate, I can actually still, I have to speak, you know, I still have to speak into that space. Even Zizek is just like, he calls it subjective destitution in some of his more recent work. And he says, like, in absolutely annihilating my conceptualizations of even the distinction between concept and life, that is, like you say, he affirms death drive, actually. Um, if, you, if you read Surplus Enjoyment, the end of the book is about death drive. And he refers to the Joker, like in the, the most recent adaptation, um, where he says, like, you have to part, like, push nihilism to its extreme. You have to destitute these very frameworks of thinking Whereas in Zizek's medium, mid medium, middle period up to now, he was afraid of psychosis, you know, like the real was actually too much in a way. But even at that point, he said, we have to just be aware that we're using the symbolic order like we are a broken stick. But now he's like, go destitute it because that's the place of freedom. So then the book after surplus enjoyment, that was the biggest book after is freedom, you know. Um, but Heidegger's different. So I, I think that was reading of Heidegger is a bit different because Heidegger really wouldn't talk about pragmatics. But then he was a fascist. So, <laughs> you know, I think this is, and people critique him for this because maybe Heidegger didn't see, or I think he didn't have time to see what letting be meant for the social world. Mm. Although if you read his middle, late, late middle period, like the 50s into the 60s, he talks about Gelassenheit the opening of the opened and actually he talks about the way that we as beings dwell together so that is actually a practical effect of knowledge and i think at that point he would say science is pragmatic not mm. philosophy philosophy is talking about truth always mm -hmm. because thinking so he wouldn't call it philosophy because it's the end of philosophy he calls it thinking like he doesn't he doesn't want philosophy at that point. He says, like, what is thinking? Like, the highest mm. thinking. Because he's saying that thinking always encounters truth. Always. And even when you're, un when you're concealed, when truth is concealed, there's still truth. It's just beings concealing it, you know? So, but this is the point as well. He's never talking about, like, the truth of this plant. He's saying it's the truth of your relation to the plant. It's the truth of your relation to this video call right now. It's mm -hmm. the truth of the relation to the ideas coming through this conversation, not the content of what we say. Unless we use thinking to think about thinking, and then you discover the truth of what he calls releasement, like being open to, you know. Um, but then that's the question, where does pragmatics come in? Maybe it comes in at the point when I say, well, science can help us to build a bridge between this town and the next. And then the question is, does that also count for like social constructs, like a political program? So when I talk about the five-year plan of transforming Great Britain into the, this is like my unconscious speaking, um, like I know that that's an interpretation which will be contingent, particular, and relative to history. 
um, and it will be pragmatic because it will also include lack in the sense that, like for example, any political program will always have those people that are excessive to that program. If you have a policy of helping the population, there will always be outliers. There will always be inconsistencies in that political choice, you know. And I think that's where this this whole conversation points to. It's like even if you don't believe in truth and you revert to pragmatism, there's an important move there. But I think even if you do believe in truth, like Heidegger did, there's still pragmatic pragmatism, but you still have to question it, you know? So it's mm -hmm. like in the question, maybe you can frame it like, what's the, what's the role of philosophy as speculative thinking about thinking and being? And then what does that, what does that mean for knowledge? How, how, what's the quality of knowledge? For example, if you don't believe in philosophy, if you don't believe in the power of speculation and metaphysics, then perhaps you're a nihilist. But even from that standpoint of nihilism, or even just liberalism, like you'd, maybe nihilism is too much for you as well, even from the standpoint of liberalism, you still have to question the quality of pragmatism in that space, you know? Mm. So maybe like there's always pragmatism, it's just depending upon your philosophical perspective, or your sociological perspective, or anything like this, the question is, where does pragmatism come in? And I think for everybody in the communities that we're kind of involved with, lack is a really important word. Like the, the first video I watched from Cadell's channel was philosophy of lack. Mm, yeah. So that's what pulled me in, because it was like, ooh, like, lack is the empty space of the Holy Spirit, you know? <laughs> oh, that is how I'm feeling today, you know. Uh -huh. It's like it pulls you in because it makes you because it's like something which seems to be beyond philosophy, like it is uh -huh. in the sense that it seems to be talking about most people's daily experience, even if it might not be actually a true phenomenon. Maybe lack's just a different word for openness, you know. At mm. least lack is a signifier which brings you to question things which is what philosophy is yeah anyway I'll, sorry. I'll let you yeah i mean you know what heidegger is letting be actually um sort of eradicates almost like a pragmatism but then also nietzsche's um love of one's fate also kind of eradicates pragmatism too which i think is very interesting um because i guess you can say pragmatism tries to avoid that really pivotal point of when you can't do anything mm -hmm. like that the, there's always that that temptation to surely i must be able to do something surely i can do something and really the only thing that you can do is only a sort of is only actually a kind of negation really right it would mm -hmm. call for a kind of heideggerian letting be or it would call for a kind of nietzschean just loving one's fate kind of thing right like mm -hmm. this is this is what's going to happen. Um, and I've been playing with this, this notion that actually um, Nietzsche's will to power, because I've been reading uh, his genealogy of morality again. Um, he brings up this notion that will to power is this pointing to the fact that there's always a new interpretation, um, a new domination of, of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking how that actually could be some, in some ways anti-pragmatic because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're subduing the um, dominating interpretation of things, right? So you're, so you're negging the pragmatism by giving a new interpretation, a new value. That's an interesting point because actually, I think this goes to what you said at the beginning of this quickly. Um, Vatimo's work basically starts from that premise, like mm -hmm. interpretation. So he's a hermeneutical philosopher who mm -hmm. introduces nihilism. So he he basically reads Nietzsche, Heidegger, but what he takes from Nietzsche is this emphasis on like the lack of the ability to do ontology, which is what Heidegger also talks about. Yeah. But basically, Vatimo brings this and emphasizes the the interpretive quality of knowledge to the degree that even the interpretation that oh knowledge is itself interpretive is also seen as being yet another interpretation i'm sure we spoke about this in the nihilism and religion conversation 
so what that does is that the negation of the negation is is constantly kind of questioning its own premise and that's in a way seems to void pragmatism but what batimo says at that point what are we looking at in this mysterious space where interpretations seem to be always up for changing always up for their own um, decline see he has an ontology but he calls it the ontology of decline because he mm. sees how truth in the history of western metaphysics is in decline and knowledge in this epoch seems to be interpretive so what we need to do is affirm the interpretation that there is only interpretation because for him that has an amazing effect on human coexistence mm. and it's the fact that that opens up space for freedom and for uh, he uses the word charity car caritas mm. caritas because he says if i let you have your interpretation and so for say for example you're on the periphery of the social political world you have like a radically new opinion according to the do dominant hegemonic feature they wouldn't want to know that because if they're hegemonic they want to maintain their hege hegemony you know yeah. so new interpretations are always discarded in the age of realism like this is the point so what nihilism shows what interpretation shows is that actually everything is kind of relative in a way yeah but that gives space to the other person that gives space to the minority to the other group you know so he says that what that is is the highest form of pragmatism because it's giving space to the other but of course those more speculative thinkers like Zizek or Zapancic or anyone else or Heidegger would say yeah but thinking can do more than just decline like you know mm -hmm. so they would agree that freedom is the consequence of thinking like for Heidegger it's the freedom to dwell for Zizek it's the freedom to also reinterpret he doesn't well, Zizek's interesting because he uses the word hermeneutics a lot in his in his thinking, and mm -hmm. half the time he's critiquing it, but the other half he's saying, yeah, perspectival distortion, absolute recalls, a kind of negation of the negation, where then afterwards you're left to play with the horizon within which you are living, and this word play is pragmatic, yeah. And this is the point with Nietzsche. Depending on how you read Nietzsche and what part of his life, he uses the word play a lot, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He talks about, and this is why Vatimo's reading is quite interesting. He talks about like how Nietzsche's work is about playing in the, the museum of history and putting on masks. And in a way, that's that's pragmatic, yeah. It's because you're you're looking at the mask and saying, mm -hmm. I'm not going to find an absolute truth here. But if I can play with this mask and use this mask as a conceptual notion in this historical epoch, when, for example, climate change is a problem. Let's do it, you know. And I think this is an important point. Like some skeptical people would deny the capability of the knowledge of climate change. Like if you're very skeptical in a very stupid way, you'll say climate change. I can't even know climate change. I'm just a relative, you know. You know. And some people, then you could say, yeah, but with that relative stupid knowledge that you think you have, put on the mask of that interpretation anyway, because you're better off doing so, just in case, you know. <laughs> so that's the thing, like. Pragmatism can even, like, in more sacred pragmatism, can tell the relative pragmatist, like, put on your mask anyway. Like, even if it's not, can't, you mm -hmm. can't know it. You, not that I affirm any of those positions, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's um, that's what I've been really fast. That's actually what I've been wanting to incorporate more is this idea of the Nietzschean mask, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I do think it almost makes me think the way you're describing this is almost like. A negative pragmatism would be more about it it sort of knows how to play with lack like mm -hmm. this idea of putting on the mask is 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 a way of playing with lack like we mm -hmm. we, we don't have the you know um and i and i think um a way to like having an example of, of just like being confused well my, my partner and i being confused about something um, and we didn't come up with a solution or anything. And then we just say, okay, like, yeah, we're confused and there's nothing that can be done. Um, weirdly enough, doing that sort of allowed us to put on a mask of just like our ignorance, <laughs> really, mm -hmm. just like a mask of our ignorance. And it, and it kind of like remedied the situation in a very strange way. I mean, it didn't like 
remedy in the in the sense, but it's sort of, um, yeah, I don't know how to describe that sort of feeling of just like we didn't solve anything, but something was done. Something was done. So uh, oh. that's why I think it's fascinating about the playing with the mask part. But this is this is a good point because um, Zizek actually talks about how Hegelia, well, the Lacanian truth that he rereads back into Hegel. That's the best way I've come to understand his work alongside Sapanchich. Sapanchich is interesting because the text, um, the shortest shadow, she's rereading Lacanian truth back into Nietzsche, mm -hmm. and she talks about perspectives, meaning interpretations, is another word, and how you get the truth. Like Zizek's doing the same with Hegel, you know, like dialectics. How can you get to the truth? And for both of them, the truth is this mask of illusion. Like what you're what you're encountering with absolute knowledge, or what Sapanchich reads is like Nietzsche's philosophy of the two, which is Alain Badu's reading of the two. Is you're putting on a mask and you're recognizing that I am affirming life affirmation is to say, I am aware that my knowledge is non-all. It's never total. There will always be divisions and contradictions and antagonisms. And so the truth, which is pragmatic in itself, meaning it has a practical effect for your daily life, for psychoanalysis is literally that, isn't it? Like psychoanalysis is the praxis of philosophy in a way. You're saying if your philosophical perspective says there is a non-all quality to not just knowledge, but also being itself, then the only thing that I can respond to is to put on the mask of that knowledge and recognize that in a sense, in a way, all of my knowledge thereafter will not be total, which means I have to make practical, pragmatic choices. And so when you have like a moment of uh, contradiction or kind of in, inconsumability with your partner, mm. a kind of psychoanalytical perspective, Lacanian in a way is to say, well, what you thought you were trying to make like to remedy can't be but in existing or coexisting in that space something moves and this is what i want to say like zizek talks about how philosophy brings you on the path and the truth of it is to be on that path so you can reframe this like philosophy brings you to the mask but the truth is just to put on the mask that you don't know absolute mm -hmm. knowing is is the limit of the type of knowledge we thought we could attain truth to for you know mm -hmm. and i think this is this and i agree up to this point by the way like I, I agree that that in my opinion that's what my reading of hegel which is is in a way kind of limited it's i'm heavily biased by heidegger's reading of hegel <laughs> of course I'm, I'm always heidegger's always there for me for now give me two years and i'll be post heideggerian that would, that would be good um he Hegel's basically what Hegel's doing is he's showing that that moment of ontologizing lack, meaning saying, okay, being itself is lacking. And that means I have to respond to being in that way. And Zizek says that Lacan is beyond being. But I don't think so. I think still mm. the real is another word for being. Even if Lacan really emphasizes that he's not a philosopher. He's post philosophy. Philosophers are stupid because they want to get to being, but the real is beyond being and them. My point is that what Hegel shows us is that we can't call being lack, you know, because even even the word for being then would follow the logic that that itself is lacking. So you can't talk about this. And in a way, it just gets with this because that's what the negation of the negation means, you know. Mm. Like you just constantly fall upon the repetition of impossibility. But that moment or that experience for Zizek and Zapanchic is where you wait in a way. And there you can deduce that being is itself really lacking. So what they both bring you to in their philosophies is to, Zapanchic always brings the word silence. It's at the moment of silence, the event when something new creeps in, but what the only truth that repeats itself is that there is a lack there's there's like because this is like the negation negation like i experienced the failure of an argument with the partner i then try to reconcile myself with the partner but then i keep on confronting a kind of lack 
in the repetition of lag, you know, and even then to kind of reflect by myself in the other room. And I like the only moment of change is when I recognize that lack is actually always going to be a part of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, then from that perspective, that event, you're opening yourself up to beings like this is their point in a way. But mm-hmm. I would say, and this is where Heidegger would come in, that moment and Hegel, to go back to Hegel, which I was trying to do, that moment of the experience of like not knowing is not because there is a, a lack to life or a lack, which then means a lack in instances, you know. It's not a lack. Instead, it's an indeterminacy, an opening within which your quality of experience can change and then bring you to truth, which for Hegel, in my opinion, is to know that like being and knowledge is not separate. That's the conclusion. And you are consciousness that's moving as knowledge and being which is a very like and so then you can never resort to like pre-kantian philosophy which says being is like or for heidegger in the last period which is in the second part of my whole research is saying in the experience of indeterminacy it's not lack but it's the opening within which things move like in the sense that things are gathered to my mind and i am gathered to experiences and the truth is the quality of that, which is always about being opened or released or given over. And so that's why for me, it's never lack. But then again, this goes back to the question. So like, for example, just quickly, in an argument with a partner, the, the moment of reconciliation for me, or the moment of truth, is to let the, like, the, the, like, the true things happening on a daily level, you know, like economic situation, work, pressures, family pressures, the only thing to do is to let those be together in the sense that you say the only way to move with these happenings and these things is to just say like, okay, they are going on and the only way to change them is to give them space to develop or to let them be in that sense, you know? Mm-hmm. And even each other, like, and I think a lot of problems with relationships is that we don't let that person be. We constrain them, like O.G. Rose, like Daniel would say, with the bird on the hand, and you grab the bird. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think again, that's maybe another way to read pragmatics into Heidegger is to say pragmatically, psychotherapeutically, there is a real pragmatic um, truth to letting, to letting, to to waiting, to hanging out in the moment of silence, you know? Mm -hmm. I think um, you're making me think that, because Nietzsche's point on this is really interesting. Um, He talks about how forgetfulness is an active force, which I actually thought was really brilliant, because Mm -hmm. you would think forgetfulness is sort of passive, but Daniel always talks about this too, like, you need to be able to maybe forgetfulness is good right to be able to move on and to to let things be ironically mm-hmm. right and then nietzsche even says like you need forgetfulness and his skepticism is maybe forgetfulness is the only way that you can actually love man like love mm-hmm. man it's man himself um so it makes me wonder if the pragmatism that we have today is actually reactive rather than active this would be mm-hmm. Nietzsche's critique, right? Um, so to have a pragmatism that is active and not reactive is um, something like what you're you're talking about would be like letting this letting be because letting is not. I don't think it's. I don't think it's reactive because if it was reactive, mm-hmm. you wouldn't want to let go. You would want to do something other than that. The same thing with you wouldn't want to forget either, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think the Nietzsche, I like Nietzsche in, in terms of negative pragmatism for, for explaining the pathos behind pragmatism. Why, mm-hmm. why do you crave the pragmatic thing? And I would say in terms of pathos, pragmatism gives a sort of, there's something cruel about pragmatism, actually. There's something about it that Nietzsche would say it's cruel. At least it's when when it's in a reactive state. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, that's exactly the point. I think that's a really nice way to understand it. And I think 
in a way, reactive pragmatism is a kind of deflated pragmatism because it doesn't do what Nietzsche did, which is pass through thinking. Like Nietzsche is a philosopher. Like people say that he's not, but he's he is a philosopher. Like the way he writes maybe is not typical to the history that he's coming from, but that's his point. Because that's the thing, like he's passing through thinking. He's passing through different qualities or shapes of thinking. He's psychologizing thinking in a way, like Hegel did, you know, like Heidegger did. It's like critiquing a type of thinking and then coming to the question of like how to think today, you know, like <laughs> as a contemporary way of putting it, like, you know, um, how to think today, but like not just today, because if it's philosophy, it's not just about today. Pragmatism would say, yep, yeah, how are we, like, what do we think today? But then tomorrow that's going to change. Mm-hmm. But philosophy is to say, is there something universally true or absolute about thinking? about knowledge, about the destination of knowledge, where it brings you in your experience? And does that change your quality of experience? And I think reactive pragmatism, and I would actually charge Vatimo with a type of reactive pragmatism, Mm. because he really gets stuck. He has really radical moments where he opens you to freedom, to grace, to charity, which if you want to like pinpoint it and define it, is like the contours of letting be. But he would never theologize it, philosophize it, <laughs> philosophize, theologize it in a way. Maybe that's my project. Philosophize it, like he would, he would say, yeah, but even that's an interpretation. So we just have to react to the history of those previous interpretations and don't get too optimistic about knowledge, you know? And in a way, it's like, I think he gets stuck because he's not wanting to move beyond modern philosophy. Because if he thinks you, if you try to move beyond it, you end up in nihilism again. So he's very reactive, you know, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of the hermeneutic philosophers are, like Zizek critiques um, historicists. He calls them like um, discursive historicists who are really reactive because they don't want to think about thinking in a way because they just instantly go into it and say, it's limited, like, what's the point? Yeah. Like, this is my perspective. Like, um, you're not going to, you can't talk about being. Like, what? Like, you can't talk about universal truth, you know? And that's why Hegel's interesting. And Zizek makes this point. Like, Hegel was a post Kantian philosopher, and Kant had the limited knowledge to a certain horizon, you know? Like, the categories. What's absolutely true are the categories themselves, because they are a priori, like, they are before experience anything that comes to be understood within those categories will be subject to change so in a way like he cornered off philosophy hegel said wait like this has its truth but you need to see how even the categories are subject to change and knowing this is absolute change in knowledge and stuff mm-hmm. and i think otherwise otherwise you yeah you'll end up in a reactionary sort of i think i did find a quote when you were talking as well mm. Um, I realized having a word document and typing like control F and just typing in a word has changed my yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I only learned this the last one year, like especially on the net. Like, someone says something, I'm like, oh, let me look for this to see if there's anything, and it really is good. Um, but there's a book I keep talking about a lot because it's really important, it's called um the dash the other side of absolute knowledge it's a reading of hegel the two contemporary philosophers um and they talk about a neo like a neopolonic what's i can't think of what they call it they call it like a a truer pragmatism and they say like if you pass through hegel's most speculative metaphysical bone you end up with a truer pragmatism um because it is one which keeps itself to the absolute. So for example, they say this. Um, yeah, exactly. Without the critical speculative edge of an absolute knowing, which is what Zizek's knowing is like, um, of the edge of incompleteness attached to each idea, pragmatism deflates into an unwarranted movement of half-hearted attempts to deal with life or deal with the outside, which is the, passive yeah it's like oh i have to deal with life 
um, in this sense, both thinkers claim, quote, like, whereas for the deflationary pragmatist, the space of reasons is a consistent totality and thus formally complete. And that's the point. Pragmatism becomes really critical about knowledge, but says, and this is most of the time, we have the history of ideas that we now need to use for pragmatic ends, but I can know them. I can accurately represent them without lack. You know, I think this is maybe oh, the movement of the whole thing. It's like you're incorporating lack like, even into the idea of pragmatism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but whereas um, Comey and Bruder, they argue, quote, that there is an incompleteness and ungroundedness inherent in language, lack, like a loophole in the normative fabric of the social bond. Language is internally riven by an other side, an internal foreign territory that sometimes forces us to speak, think, and act differently. Hegel's achievement is to engage this other side by exposing from within the cracks or the lacks, the cracks, the lacks, inherent in every transcendental conception of thinking and language. Uh, this unhinges the coordinates of every speaking community and introduces a fundamental dislocation into every speech act. Only from such radical disorientation does a new form of orientation become thinkable without the transcendental guarantees. And this is the point, the whole, what we said so far, like, for them, prag pragmatism finds its truth after you pass through the incompleteness of every speech act. Mm -hmm. Because with that knowledge of the mask of, of ignorance, you can then relate to your partner better because you both yeah. accept that you can't completely reconcile yourself. But of course, my thing is to question whether that's lack or whether that's um, openness, like, or, or I do have this belief and it might change that lack appears after a type of quality of knowledge fails like what Heidegger would call like metaphysical representative thinking, which tries to, for example, I want to know my partner. So I accurately represent them in my mind. And from that standpoint, I have an argument with them. A, I don't have a partner and B, so I can't have an argument with them. But like, if you follow that logic, it's like all of those presuppositions prior to the argument you did this, you said this, you didn't have this perspective, you should have, you know. Lack probably arises because in all of those statements, it's like, oh, like there's truth to it, but who am I to be the person that should have? What does it mean? What does it mean to say should have? That's a normative claim. And I think in, in that sense, like in this weird moment in our history, it's like lack appears a lot, like, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I, I notice I fail a lot in my own desire, in my own ideas, in my job applications that I didn't do. <laughs> so that I lack, there's a lack. It's like, I haven't got a job, you know, like, of course, it's like, it's like in that sense of, it appears because we're having to construct ourselves in a certain narrative of like, yeah, I'm going to have a job in September. Okay. Because, and like where we all believe in this thing called jobs, and roles and identities, I think lack at that point really does appear. And that's where Zizek and Zapancic and Komi and Ruder are great because they say, you need to reconcile yourself with the fact that you can never reconcile yourself without that experience of lack, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I still don't know how I feel about the question of, of lack. I mean, it's uh, it's like really hard to talk about um which is why i started resorting to um a more like material metaphor like i like the mask because mm -hmm. i think like the mask sort of captures the lack per se like it's it's really hard to talk about lack and just like a like a normal everyday conversation like you know <laughs> like people might understand but i think it's um the way alex ebert kind of phrased this for me was just kind of like lack Negative pragmatism, maybe not lack, but negative pragmatism would be the understanding that when something indeterminate arises, mm. you you're, you become, you decide to be okay with it. And then the moment you're okay with that indeterminacy, it mm. translates into a determinacy. 
Um, so then, in some sense, actually something is done. But he mm -hmm. made the important point to me that pragmatists tend to take the the potential, uh, well, tend to mistake the com the potential as confusion. Um, whereas the negative pragmatist would take the confusion as mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. That's a nice right. way to. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting way to put it because it's like that completely. Uh, it makes it completely understandable how or why anti anti pragmat wait anti pragmatists sorry <laughs> I was going to do the anti 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 -prag anti pragmatists. <laughs> use the word deflationary all the time because it's like in confusion they they kind of just like think for half a second and just turn back to like the empirical world and say oh we had a moment of confusion or lack but get that away from me like i don't want indeterminacy i know what that is that's nothing thinking can't think nothing so just go away like i need to deal with and cope with what's around me you know, and that's probably that's probably why, like a lot of postmodern philosophy, is discursive at the point of pragmatism because it's. And Richard Rorty is is a big. He has like the flag for this for me, and like, and I remember reading him at the time. It was really interesting. Like I remember where I was when I was reading the book. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, he's got a good critique against philosophy, <laughs> and I was like, oh, why? But I knew at the time. I was like, what I like about this is it's bringing me further into the indeterminate moment because he's kind of constantly deconstructing it but then you go through the book he says right now that we've gone through indeterminacy there's only determinacy so any more confusion you know what that is but just quickly pass it off like don't sit in that space because you might get psychosis don't mm -hmm. sit in that space because you'll just lose your mind you know um Whereas, and this, I, I, I charge, I also think Zizek's quite like this. Maybe not so much more recently, because again, like he affirms completely subject to destitution. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of goes down to your to your personal faith, like maybe with Alex E, but like I haven't really spoke to him directly, but from what I've heard from his work and even his practice as like an artist, he has a faith in the indeterminate moment or the event where even the word moment kind of dissipates because you experience um maybe i don't i don't want to frame it according to his words because i don't know his philosophy well enough but like mm -hmm. you experience i know he talks about excess and lack you experience something in the event which says something qualitatively different about it in the, in the sense that phenomenologically you trust it and you go with it and you move with that experience to the point where you could maybe say playing a guitar is pragmatic like it's a praxis which does something but maybe that's the point it's not a um, regressive or passive pragmatism it then uses technique in indeterminacy to do stuff like but not for the sake of being useful but yeah. for the sake of art for the sake of love for the sake of peace, for the sake of opening up. And this then is Heidegger completely, because when Heidegger uses the word to dwell, he always connects it with building. Like you can't you cannot dwell without building a house, not because a house is a dwelling place, but because a house gives you the open daily space in which then you can read his books. <laughs> you know, like like in the sense that you can then question your being and dwell in the mystery of not knowing up to the point where you say, well, I'm the openness which is being given over to this experience of the openness. So actually I am doing philosophy and uh, now I'm dwelling in the world where I can let this water bottle be because I realize I don't need to find the truth in it as if it's just its materiality. Like, because, you know, and the, so the truth of this water bottle becomes whatever it is for me. But the truth is the fact that it's there and it's allowing me to drink water. You know, the bridge is there in the sense that it lets me, it, or it just because it, it becomes a locality, he calls it like a position, a locality 
within which the world comes forth. Like if I see a bridge here in England from 1867 over like a small river, which you don't really see too many of them now, but when you do, it brings you to a world and it brings your world into question. Mm -hmm. And this is what he calls like the welding. Like it brings in this history, but it lets it be. And it's like, you're not going to find truth in that history. You'll find the truth of a history, but the truth is your relation to it. Like letting it speak. And again, yeah, it's just, think, yeah, yeah, so that's my philosophy coming in at that moment. And I think that moment is the important part, like indeterminacy or, yeah. No, I think, I think that's, that's, that's a lot of the, the part that I'm, I'm trying to think about because where the negative pragmatism could get really fun and really interesting is the way that we can relate to indeterminacy. All the all the various ways that we can relate to indeterminacy, as such. But wouldn't, and, and, wouldn't you call it positive pragmatism at that point? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, uh, because like for example, um, Ebert gave me this really fun example of like um, he's like, uh, what if we all did bad philosophy on purpose? Like you know, mm -hmm. he goes like, I actually told you like, you know what I think, and I broke all my philosophical rules. Um, and, and gave like a bad philosophy um, because that would allow in his mind to possibly stumble upon a good idea mm -hmm. right so it's like uh, it it would be so it makes me if, if this is what a negative pragmatism would be this is the way I, I guess I would frame it would be it would be pragmatic in so far as we get to the in, we get to the point of indeterminacy and then we let it be. How do you get there? That's my question. Yeah, so that that's the part that I'm thinking, which is, mm. I because I I imagine that when I had that when I brought the conversation about my partner thing, the, the way I mm. imagine it is that we were trying to be pragmatic in trying to solve or remedy a situation. And then we got to the point of an indeterminate position. And mm -hmm. instead of giving a, um, or staying away from it, saying like, oh, well, maybe we should do this or, or mm. something. Instead, rather, it was just like, we should just uh, share our stories about what happened, right? Like, mm. it was more about the relation versus the solution. Um, Can I just so, say one no. thing really quickly? I think yeah. like that's a really good diagnosis where I think a lot of relationships become really stale and dead end is when people become pragmatic about love and they 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 treat like that's a great way to understand what we're talking about. Like love yeah. is a speculative, phenomenological no thing, mm -hmm. and the pragmatist, if they are pragmatic in the passive sense, would not incorporate that. They would just say. This relationship's a bit stale at the moment. Let's deal with this. But the only way to reinvigorate it is to, to do what you've just said, like tell a story, because I think when you tell a story about it, you're giving space to a different quality of knowledge and you're letting the other story come forth. And then perhaps when it's coming forth, meaning from the person's mouth, you look at their mouth and say, oh, they're pretty. Like there's a reason why I love them. You know, because I'm I'm not seeking the truth of the circumstances. I look at them and say, like, oh, I love this person. And in that event of indeterminacy, because you can't then quantify it, then maybe things start to become malleable again, you know? Mm -hmm. I think this is, and this is personal experience, like when a, uh, an ex-partner probably is in a routine and did not incorporate that indeterminacy, but was trying to fix the situation, you know, to be active about it, that was the the low, like, that was the most passive thing in a way. Yeah, yeah, in a way. In a yeah. way. Whereas, yeah. and this is my some of my friends charge me with this now, like, <laughs> letting be is just like the highest form of doing nothing, and it's like, no, nah, like it's the highest form of care. Like, let's yeah. be silent for a second. Let's laugh about the the weird moments. You know. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, it's like 
the the Nietzschean joy kicks in a bit because you're like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use my words knowing that the words are kind of broken. That they're relative maybe a little bit, that I'm particular when I talk about them because I have my own personal experiences and traumas and stuff. But I'm okay. Like I'm aware of my historicity. I'm aware of my contingency. I'm aware of my particularity. And I'm going to affirm it at that point to say, right here, right now, I can't change this. Let me try to speak into it and see what happens. And I think that attitude is kind of what releasement means in a way. It's like, and that's what accepting lack means in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, people really do try to be pragmatic about um, love. And there's a lot of like, uh, like podcasts and everything about what they want and what they desire. And psychoanalysis is really good about showing that they may know what they want, but they don't know what they desire. Um, mm. And something my partner told me, which I think was a perfect example of like how you go from a very pragmatic idea to then accepting the indeterminacy precisely because the person before you presents that indeterminacy, which was that mm -hmm. my partner originally was like, I'm never going to, um, her ideal was that we would live separately, right? Whoever her future partner would be would live separately from her. And then she mm -hmm. said to me, and this was like really funny, was that she said that when she met me, she realized that's not what she wanted. Mm -hmm. So I provoked this sort of indeterminate moment where it, it undid her determinacy about the way she wanted to pragmatically love and live. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm present, I'm there, um, she sort of like, since I've undone her determinacy in a way, she doesn't know what to do, mm -hmm. right? So she's um, so it's 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 a very fascinating uh, relation. But I I do think indeterminacy is is one of those things that allows relations to have depth. Mm -hmm. right? This is why I like the Nietzschean mask concept because he did say something like, "The mask of the profound profound beings wear a mask," or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I really enjoy that. Um, but I'm still thinking, and I, I still think it's a problem about how do we think about the various ways that we can relate to indeterminacy, mm -hmm. or is there just are we just sort of this, are we this, only this reacting to it? Question. That's the perfect question. Like, how do we relate to indeterminacy? Um, because I think automatically that brings in the question of lack. Mm -hmm. and the question of pragmatics i think that's what's useful is like to understand yeah there's a history of pragmatism there's a history of like people who repeatedly obsess about being pragmatic compared to not being pragmatic because all they do is be pragmatic you know or active in a passive way in a way um but i think the question of like this indeterminacy really brings into light like how i see philosophy like and i've realized this like a lot of my interests in the past about philosophy were like and i remember reading Zizek the first time and i was also reading alan watts a lot and i realized like and I, the way i framed it at the time i was thinking like what Zizek's doing is he's critiquing ideology which is a type of stupid knowledge which we are all subject to which tries to seek truth according to a type of knowledge which doesn't work mm -hmm. that's the way i framed it so i was like what Zizek's doing is like he's gone back into the cave to show us that that thinking leads to that sort of perverse desire it leads to violence it leads to la 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 and then at the time i was like well alan watts is talking about the true like the experience that i would would enjoy or was enjoying you know and for Adam Watts, the word indeterminacy is it. Like mm. the Tao of Taoism yeah. is that which cannot be named. Mm -hmm. But in that experience of undoing the desire to name it, it comes forth as that which gives you <laughs> a type mm. of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So like that was the other side 
So I always thought like Zizek is critiquing the dynamics of our 21st century, la 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 la. And on the other side, you have this moment of like personal particular undoing, which brings you to this question of the indeterminate space, you know? Alan Watts is a pragmatist at that point. Mm-hmm. He says, so he's he's critical about language into the sense that he affirms its inability. He's very Kantian, like he says, yeah, like knowledge is knowledge will always be a symbol of phenomena. So in a way, he he says like, yeah, language is a product of life of the Tao, but we have to be fully aware that language is always limited to a certain horizon, and it's practical. It does stuff. It builds houses. It builds bridges, and that's it. Thinking can't think. So for him, the Taoist experience or Zen Buddhist experience to a certain point is indeterminate, meaning outside of language. And so I used to believe that. I used to believe like, oh, you can have an experience where you're outside of the symbolic world, you're into the phenomenological thing. But I think what Heidegger is good at showing and Hegel is that that experience of indeterminacy is what he calls being. being language is the house of being so i think language and thinking will always be even in indeterminacy so the question is how does language come forth in that experience you know Mm. even like artistic language so this is why it's important with heidegger to look at like what does it mean to to um in frame an art piece like put forward produce an art piece what does it mean to do art what does it mean to write poetry because poetry for him is the highest form of indeterminate experience but you're using words yeah that's right that's interesting that's right so when like Huderlein writes these poems about like the steeple in the blue sky that sits on a green field which for Heidegger is like oh this is the truth what's true about it is that it's bringing you this world but in a released quality and that experience releases you to it and it releases you to it to you and there's a trans appropriation of that but then alan watts would be pragmatic he would say mm, yeah poetry does that but <laughs> don't rely on language to bring it to you like it, even poetry is a symbol of the real thing you know um kind of forgot where i was going at this point but that happens a lot with me I <laughs> but sometimes it comes full circle so i'm going to give i'm going to let that potential possibility be um yeah yeah but that's that's just a really nice way to frame it like indeterminacy how where where does pragmatism come into that space in a way like mm-hmm. especially when it comes to society shared communal programs social media the conversation the other day on the net like the virtual real life versus the virtual like what does it mean to engage in those spaces with knowledge knowing that my social identity is not real to the point that even who i think i am behind the scene of social identity is also not real you know Mm. like how then do i relate to that because then of course i still have like an instagram profile so it's like i know that this is not real and i know that the eye that i think i am behind this profile is also not real like it's a product of history so then at that point on both sides you say well the real of me in real life is gone like not gone but it's a product of thinking and that indeterminate moment where you're like oh like what does that mean lack like lack on both sides of the of the thing and even in the middle like where does how do we why do we still use instagram knowing that you know Mm -hmm. why do i still talk to you knowing that you know like why are we talking Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) and the problem is if you say oh because it's useful like i'd I'd rather not (laughs) if everything was just like usefulness but that's some people have this belief like evolution mm-hmm. like like of course evolution is true but like we as human beings are surviving in the world we're using language to like have like these unfulfilled desires there's always like this kind of unconscious desire for reproduction la, 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 la. you know but i don't believe that 
yeah like i think there's something more about language and there's something more about where that brings us in terms of experience like i i, I do believe more high digger than i would shishak patimo as a punchage like i think i think there is a way of language which is to like pause like between words and not to say like i don't for example i'm not like shishak shishak used to use the word illusory quite a lot when he talks about semblances like thinking as like semblance is like spectral in a way um because i'm not trying to look at this plant and tell you the truth even if i was a scientist a biologist the type of truth that i could tell you about this plant would not be the truth i'm looking for in a way it's a truth in its way but it's not the type of truth i'm looking for so i can look at the plant and say like ah this reminds me of the moment that this came into this room you know like because i think truth's on the side of that relation you know mm -hmm. or if i look at a hammer i can say yeah this could build me a house if i knew the technique to do so or the money <laughs> i'm a student still so i don't have money um you know and i think that's a nice way to approach knowledge because you're always kind of being a bit indeterminate about it but not because you're like oh i'm restricted in my thinking it's like no like biology can do a lot like physics can do a lot you know quantum physics does a lot like good but it's saying that in being a bit indeterminate about it i can have a relation to it which in the relation there's truth you know and then i can be pragmatic because i can say like all right one day i might be able to like afford not paying rent maybe you know and mm -hmm. that's a pragmatic choice to survive yeah. well it's to just have a nicer space you know hopefully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think truth has to always be there because then you become really 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 engaged about pragmatic life mm -hmm. like i want to talk to my partner i don't have a partner i want to talk to my partner because i love this person and i know that maybe there was that weird moment because i was really tired and really hungry and when i get hungry i'm moody <laughs> and it's like you can affirm it because you say like uh, like you know like i think that's the point it becomes the highest form of care because you know like yes i can be stupid yes i can say certain things in particular ways i'm conditioned but even beyond conditioning i'm just stupid and at that point you can let it be and enjoy the you know it, yeah so uh, unfortunately i have to go but no, it's, it's so um but no just a quick comment on this like no this is great because it's like I'm really starting to see like the Nietzsche Heidegger tie in here because mm -hmm. the love of the love of one's fate is it's very, very similar to this. I mean, he talks about how the criminal in the most like aristocratic sense would just accept that actually Nietzsche used this very good term. Like the, the criminal is the one that understood that this went contrary to his expectation. Mm -hmm. Right, like it exceeded. Like there is a sort of there is a sort of indeterminacy about it, and then the only way to to get around that is to affirm the indeterminacy, right? Accept the punishment. Accept, you know, to to say things like, "Yes, I was hungry. Uh, I made this mistake," or you know, "I know my partner's like this, but I love them." So it's like there's this weird way where accepting one's uh, loving one's fate is a way to actually have a real care mm -hmm. for another being, mm -hmm. which is something that we avoid to do because accepting something like one's fate or, or a letting be seems really contrary to use, mm -hmm. to, to utility, to what can I gain from this, mm -hmm. which is only to say that we could gain, but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, and that's actually a way to be more deeply pragmatic with the indeterminacy of, mm -hmm. of life and things. Yeah, that's a really nice way to put it. And I think, again, this is the point. If you bring speculative good philosophy into the equation, pragma pragmatism remains, but it just becomes like sublated. It becomes different. It becomes like of a higher quality in a way because it's no longer seeking absolute truth in pragmatic choices nor is it relegating truth to some impossible la 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 it's saying like there's a truth for me like this is my personal opinion like 
there's a truth in a quality of experience. Like, for example, indeterminacy. There's a truth about indeterminacy in the sense that it gives me a quality of experience that I know is beyond even me just saying, oh, I like it. Oh, it's good. It's useful. It's not. It's a truth. It, it has its truth. It's, a, it's an opening up. And I think when you experience this, then I think automatically you become pragmatic when needs be. Like, for example, if you're not enjoying the situation, life circumstance you're in now, uh, the only the only way to change that, in a way, is to make sure that what you're thinking will be the next step. It, it's like that's not going to make you complete or total or all. You know, like you solving the relationship with the partner is not going to fix anything like in a way yeah. because truth is truth is on the side of your own relation to truth but when you get with the truth i think that the truth then means letting things be in the sense that they are already let be your partner is a being who is living or even if they like, they pass away like like if someone passes away like there's still a letting there in the sense that they're still let over to you like they're given to you in your mind like in your experience you know like and when you recognize that you can't that's like what i'm more fatty like it means literally like the love of fate at that point where you say i love the fact that in this experience i am the being that's given over to this experience despite whatever's happening at that point i'm no longer seeking truth around me then i can say well practically it's not great to be living back in this town or and I know that in the world around me, which is still a bit quite stupid, like we all are, everyone makes really bad decisions, in this society, in this system or systems, I can make certain choices like doing a philosophy degree, mm. <laughs> doing a PhD in philosophy, like thinking that that might get me somewhere on something I might enjoy. It's a practical choice, you know? And of course it could be wrong because like the, the market's changing constantly in terms of funding and jobs for philosophy, you know? So it's like, I have to be practical at that point and pragmatic, but not because I'm seeking complete fulfillment in a job, but because I know that that job will give me more time and space, ideally, to do what I know I prefer, which is to be open to indeterminacy. And if I can teach that, I'm like that's great it's like cool like i can teach things that open me up if you're an art teacher a music teacher or if you love coding or anything and you find that, that brings you to these gaps and inconsistencies of code and it makes you feel this way you know and, and i think the highest experiences are in these moments when you you wait a little bit or a bit silent you know mm -hmm. in a way like pra pragmatics comes into that point where it, pragmatics is like bringing you to truth so think about philosophy like i know you need to go like heidegger hegel they wrote all these books well well actually thomas um yeah. so if you still have time mm -hmm. i can bring you onto this other call that i had already like planned which mm -hmm. was with luber and jockin oh yeah what time is it is it planned you would like it so yeah it's it's starting right now with them so oh, okay. if you would like to jump in with them yeah, if yeah. you have like another hour to spare, um, I could stay for as long as my my okay. eyes stay open. Yeah, now. yeah. If if you want, um, I could just cut this recording and then start it. Invite you because I think yeah. it would actually be really surprising to bring you on because they don't they wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll but, uh, but I'll stop this recording.